More than six weeks after the province of Ontario declared a state of emergency, businesses here continue to contend with ongoing closures and uncertainty. With us now, all from the provincial capital on what this is all doing to small and medium-sized enterprises in the province, we welcome Jan De Silva. She's president and CEO of the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Ashley Challoner, vice president of policy at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and Rafael Gomez, associate professor and director of the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the University of Toronto. And we are delighted to welcome all of you uh, to our broadcast tonight. Uh, welcome to my attic, and we hope that you are uh, all managing uh, through this pandemic. Ashley, just get us started here. I'm sure there's people watching us right now saying small business, medium-sized business. How many employees is that anyway? Or what's the revenues on that anyway? So just let's, let's agree on what we're talking about here. Define it if you would. Sure. So uh, small and medium sized businesses generally mean businesses that have fewer than 500 employees. So 500 plus is large. Anything under 500 is considered small and medium. Small and medium. Yeah. Small itself is usually under 100. And there's also micro businesses, which tend to be under five employees. Gotcha. Uh, you're out there surveying your members, obviously. What are they telling you right now about how things are? Things are very challenging uh, for, for all businesses. It doesn't matter what sector they're in, uh, what size, what region of the province. Uh, everyone's been impacted. Uh, and uh, so that may mean a loss of revenue. It may mean uh, having to lay off employees, uh, close their doors permanently. Uh, there's been disruption really all across the province and all throughout the economy. Jan, when I hear people use the word challenging, that's usually a euphemism for awful. Um, do you want to use the word challenging or do you want to be more descriptive than that? Well, clearly some parts of the economy are being very badly challenged. Certainly our Main Street businesses that have relied on foot traffic and, and on-site customers. Um, but what I did want to point to, what we've seen progressively over the past couple of weeks, is a real acceleration on the part of particularly our Main Street businesses of trying to find other solutions to stay in business. So while it's incredibly challenging out there, the overhead costs of rent, um, staff and supplies, those types of things, there are some emerging success stories of companies, a uh, small retailer in my neighborhood has shipped over to Shopify, much to my husband's distress, because I'm now doing some shopping there that I wouldn't have ordinarily been able to do. But I did want to say the challenge of this point in time is translating into an accelerated attention to how do we get our businesses digital, how do businesses rethink their business models for success going forward. And to that end, is this something that they are waiting for the province to help, or the federal government to help them do? Or is this more along the lines of, I need to innovate, I need to figure something else out, otherwise I'm not going to make it? Look, the businesses we're talking to, they're not there. This is an, uh, an imperative for them. This is the future of their businesses. The stimulus that all levels of government have provided are really just stop, stop gaps to help them get through the now. But what comes next is very much uh, back to them. I know if I could speak for a second, the city of Toronto a couple of years ago launched a program called Digital Main Street. It's a program they run with Roger, Shopify, Google, MasterCard, and it provides the tools for a Main Street business to get the support it needs to think about how it can create more of a digital model for their business. Uh, some very exciting news that the city is about to announce is next month they're going to be launching a second generation of this program called Shop Here, where they're actually going to be getting some university students working with small business to set up 4,000 online shops for our main, main street businesses. So uh, there's a lot that's happening and it's an at, a, at an accelerated pace through the pandemic because we can't wait to take advantage of new business models. It's an absolute imperative. Hmm. Raphael, if you would just take us, take us essentially through the economy, sector by sector yeah. by sector by sector, who's really struggling right now? Well, I mean, the, the, the place, so there's the, the larger entities that have had to close down your uh, auto manufacturers, they're suffering, but they're on the large scale and they have at least gone through uh, major restructuring before this, which actually allowed them to be prepared for the crisis. It's sad that, uh, you know, GM, for example, closed or announced closures of that Oshawa plant. But in a way, that kind of rationalization prior to this event forestalled the worst uh, of what could have happened in that sector. But cascading down from that, you have the small and medium sized suppliers, uh, your, your manufacturers of, of parts, which haven't had those sort of deeper pockets or wells of money that accumulated for over a decade uh, and which are feeling, I think, a, a tougher impact from this. And then 
spilling over into that, you have sectors like tourism, the hospitality sector, which was huge, especially in a city like Toronto and even the region. Think of the whole, all the Golden Horseshoe. And how much yeah, Stratford, um, Niagara on the Lake. Strat Think of them. Exactly. Yeah, small urban centers have really benefited from the, the boom in personal services and hospitality and tourism and that kind of cultural industry. That's all been shut down and that's that's hurting uh, tremendously those communities, those businesses, and the, of course the employees that have that have lost their jobs um, in that sector. Let me follow up with this uh, with you, Raphael, and, and the answer yeah. to this might be obvious, but I, I, I never like to assume. So tell us this, um, are small and medium sized businesses inherently more vulnerable during economic downturns than say uh, the largest companies are, which of course would still have, you know, significant expenditures, et cetera. Yeah. And, and like, you know, t take a no. look at the airline industry. I mean, tremendous mm -hmm. expenditures and, and nothing happening at all. Who's more vulnerable? No, not necessarily. It's, but the nature of the pandemic changes it. But I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Argentina in, in the early 2000s went through a profound economic crisis. It literally overnight, uh, the economy essentially shut down. They had pegged their currency to the, the dollar and that didn't work. Companies literally just left, you know, Vodafone, all these telecom companies, you couldn't call into Argentina. But what happened is the resilience was bottom up. What you saw is big employers had to shut down because that capital that was mobile and it could flow around the world. And when it saw that its returns were diminishing, left Argentina. But those small scale capitalists, the entrepreneurs, the small businesses rejuvenated a lot of the urban centers and Buenos Aires, for example, benefited from a boom of people who had lost jobs in big sectors and industries and started small businesses at a local level. That, 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 that can happen. I think small businesses are very resilient. Entrepreneurs, that Main Street um, capital is very resilient. Jane Jacobs spoke about the entrepreneurship and the creativity that occurs on the street level. I think that could happen. The problem is we've shuttered our economy. We've told businesses, you cannot open. Yes, there's that creativity that's emerged, uh, sort of curbside shopping and appropriating some of those digital tools that the large players have been using uh, earlier than the small smaller businesses. But when you've effectively just overnight told these businesses to shut down, they don't have room to be creative. And I would actually kind of point in the direction of, of where are we going with this? Because it strikes me as odd that you have the Costco's and uh, the Walmart's able to be open because they're essential because they have food uh, businesses on the side, but all of their commercial activity, their retail is also open. So people are buying things that would have otherwise been bought on main streets but we've told the Main Street operators they're not safe. But I would ask, does a Main Street shopping experience cause any more sort of uh, potential risk than entering a Costco where the throughput in an hour is equivalent to a week's worth of people going into the small store that's on their Main Street? So I think there is resilience at the bottom, but you have to give them a chance and an opportunity, and you need the other actors, governments, to help them. Well, we just saw a little cameo from a very small person behind you, which, uh, which <laughs> oh. is adorable, I can say. That's the small bit. That's the BBC dad moment. I just had it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Jen, I, I suspect there's a lot of people watching and listening on podcasts right now who, as the expression goes, uh, have never met a payroll and they do not understand all of the expenditures. You know, the, the typical, uh, you can set your watch by them, costs that uh, small and medium sized enterprises have to deal with month by month by month. Could you take us through a bit of a list just so everybody can understand what SMEs are dealing with right now? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, since the beginning of the outbreak, we've been doing a bi-weekly insights questionnaire with the business community. So we've been taking uh, uh, checkpoints all the way along. I think the key challenges that are facing small businesses, let's say it's a restaurant in your neighborhood, a dry cleaner in your neighborhood, it's two main pain points are rent and uh, staff costs. There's been a stimulus that's come along over the past uh, couple of weeks to help with that, but we're still in a situation where in the absence of revenue, uh, we've got businesses that are unable to both cover payroll and cover these costs. I think the good news is that some of the programs that are, are have been announced by the government, like the Emergency Benefits Act, which is providing $40,000 of funding for businesses to cover some of those costs, and more recently, the rent relief, that will provide up to 75% reduction in rent will go a long way just to keep those businesses intact until they can reopen and get customers back in. But the overhead is just phenomenal for these small businesses, many of whom um, are living kind of month to month based on the revenues of their stores after they've covered all these other costs. 
What about things like insurance or workplace safety insurance board premiums? Do they still mm -hmm. have to pay those now? Uh, there's been a number of items that have been uh, deferred or put on hold. We've actually, um, about four weeks ago, we put up a portal called supportbusiness.bot.com and it's a one-stop center to get information on all the various government programs and private sector programs available. We've also got live chat support. Um, it's interesting, I spoke about these bi-weekly uh, questionnaires that we're doing. The last one, we released the results on April 19th. At that point, we were four weeks into a number of stimulus programs and 43% of our businesses indicated they were still confused about how to go about qualifying and applying. So it's really important that we uh, encourage businesses to look at tools like supportbusiness.bot.com or other tools available just to understand what's available so they can get uh, badly needed cash flow coming in. Well, I guess the fact is actually there's a lot out there. I mean, the, the, the federal and provincial and municipal governments for that matter, in terms of property tax uh, relief, uh, you know, they've all been quick out the gate to get different programs out there. Do, do you know whether or not your members find them satisfactory to the challenges they're facing? Uh, you know, I think we're all very pleased and very impressed with how all levels of government have been listening to the business community and, and have taken fairly quick steps uh, to support that community during what is really an unprecedented time of need. Um, we have, of course, found some uh, challenges with the, uh, the programs, uh, whether uh, the, the issue is uh, getting cash fast enough out the door or um, criteria for, um, for actually applying to these programs being too restrictive. Um, a good example is uh, how many of these programs seem to be one size fits all. So they'll have a, um, a set revenue loss threshold in order to qualify. So for the commercial rent relief program, it's 70%. And we found that that's actually, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, holding some businesses that are otherwise deserving back from applying because they don't have that revenue loss threshold. But because of their margins or their business model or other factors, uh, they have a lower revenue loss threshold, but one that's still devastating. So we'd really like to see a bit more flexibility in these programs, uh, recognizing that there's many different kinds of businesses and they're all equally deserving. Flexibility means what? So uh, perhaps a profit profitability test or a sliding scale in terms of uh, revenue loss threshold, something that captures more businesses uh, in the program cri criteria. Understood. Let's, if we can, uh, open up the discussion here and talk about the retail sector. And by that, I mean, I want to get a better understanding of, of what was happening before the pandemic hit and whether or not since COVID-19, the move to online is going to be accelerated that much more because people are going to be too uncomfortable or nervous about gathering in person in a bricks and mortar retail establishment. Jan, can you start us off on that? What do you think is going to happen? Um, well, certainly, and I was talking to Deanne Brisbois yesterday, head of Retail Council of Canada. She's connected uh, to our organization. Um, she and I both agree this is uh, definitely a, a tipping point where we are going to see businesses of all shapes and sizes, all retailers, uh, moving much more towards e-commerce. That's where the consumer mindset is going to be. That said, there were some really good examples uh, before COVID hit. Um, Main Street stores that were putting uh, Canada Post outlets in there to handle e-commerce drop off and pick up. Those are very good ways of getting traffic into their stores by, by also being connected to e-commerce. So to answer your question, yes, we believe this is a trend that is going to be accelerated. Consumers are going to want to continue it and it is going to be a shifting point for our retailers. Ashley, what do you see in terms of whether bricks and mortar are now going to be a thing of the past? Well, I think we've seen from some initial surveys that uh, consumers aren't just going to rush out uh, and uh, patronize their local uh, retail establishments, restaurants, bars, etc. Um, we're not quite sure yet uh, how permanent that's going to be. But something that I think we need to think about is what the impact on regional inequity in Ontario is going to be. Because a lot of these small businesses, a lot of these independent businesses, the ones that make up uh, the, the downtowns and small communities, um, they don't have access to uh, sufficient broadband internet to be an e-commerce mm -hmm. or to offer e-commerce. Um, they rely on, um, on people coming into their store. They rely on their local communities and their local communities rely on them as well. 
So what happens when consumer behavior shifts? What happens when many of these uh, stores fail because of the pandemic? What does that mean for a community that relied on them for employment, for goods and services, for uh, sponsoring a local soccer team? There's going to be a, a really big shift, I think, outside of the major urban centers in Ontario because of this. Yeah. But I think if I could jump in, I think Ashley I... raises a, a very good point, and that is, I think, the, the big um, uh, element that we're all paying attention to right now is broadband coverage. Um, there's even parts of Toronto, uh, Durham region, where you've got people trying to work from home where we don't have the right levels of, of broadband coverage. So I think that's something where you're going to need to see much more even distribution of broadband for just the reasons that uh, Ashley's mentioned. Steve, um, yes, uh, th the one thing that we uh, can learn, um, there was a, a problem in our hospitality sector about a decade and a half ago. Um, there were reports of people getting sick from having re frequented restaurants and the, the kind of inspection system had slipped a little. The city very creatively innovated and created those very uh, iconic now, the green, yellow, red. Uh, and, and every time people see that green um, certificate on the, on the side of a, a store, they're much more willing to enter. Um, and that really spurred and kind of the growth of that hospitality sector here in Toronto. I think we could do something similar and the city's thinking along these lines of how can you kind of COVID proof as much as you can the main street and the businesses to allow you that sense of security that if you went in, you won't uh, be un, uh, unduly affected by a risk. Um, I think some sort of system where you apply the same kind of public health guidelines around having sort of gloves as you enter and some of the disinfectants, if that can be sort of spread around the city and working in partnership with the local BIAs, the business improvement areas that basically cover most of the, the main streets in the, in the city, mm -hmm. I think you could give the public a sense of that security. Because remember, it's not just whether businesses have access to broadband, it's whether consumers do. And there's a huge dichotomy between those that have and those that have not. And a lot of people that are at the lower and, and, and uh, income scale have to do their shopping still in person and you would be sort of shutting them out. And, and where do we want people to go after this crisis when we reopen? Do we want them crisscrossing the city going into the huge power centers where I think the, the risk of spreading disease is much higher? Or would you rather them shopping local in their own communities where the risk could be much lower? So I think we want to do the, the latter and I think the city has a lot of tools that can help that. Jen, let me just see if I understand this brave new world. And uh, let's just take, for example, a bookstore, your local bookstore. Uh, books obviously have flat surfaces. There are shelves there with flat surfaces. These, as we know, are great transmission uh, surfaces for COVID-19. Are we imagining a future where everybody who walks into that bookstore is gonna be handed a pair of protective gloves and maybe a mask in order to go browse? Is that the future? Um, you know, quite frankly, we've, uh, it could well be, and this is all being considered at the moment. I mean, we're going to be waiting for guidelines from the province and the cities around what the conditions are for reopening. But since the beginning, we've had a business continuity working group, which is uh, across a range of sectors. The business continuity experts within those firms um, even including firms like GE and Ford who are already reopened in other markets around the world. And they're bringing back into our discussions how they've had to change the way they do business as they've reopened. And things like PPE is going to be a common commonplace. Uh, people are, are indicating until a vaccine's in place. So I think there's a lot more um, that we need to be considering as we're thinking about reopening. And your bookshop example is a really good example. I think for the public to be comfortable, it is going to need to have a sense that we're doing as much as we can to prevent the spread. And um, I agree as well with what Raphael said. I think this is a very innovative point in time to think about what kind of designations we can give to our businesses, which is also giving them a toolkit to get ready to reopen with the confidence of the consumer they want to serve. Well, that does raise the question, Ashley. I mean, that would be a massive cultural change in the way we shop. And it would, you know, I'm just getting uncomfortable thinking about the notion of somebody handing out gloves and masks as you go into a retail establishment. Um, we're, we're talking about potentially a very new normal. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this something you think business has got its head around yet? Not quite. We're, we're working on it. I think there's, uh, there's a lot um, that we don't understand yet about the implications of the pandemic and the way that we've all responded to it. Um, and something that we need to think about as well, you know, we've, we've seen the government move very quickly to offer immediate supports to business, to uh, individuals who've been laid off. 
um, and, and to landlords and tenants. But what comes next? You know, if you're a, a small business that managed to survive this, you're starting to reopen. Uh, there's a lot of questions and a lot of costs about how you go about doing that. So you need to rehire people. You need to somehow secure PPE, which is often difficult to do. You have to train your employees on how to use that PPE properly. You have to keep purchasing PPE and perhaps even retrofit parts of your business in order to meet new health and safety standards. That's a lot of money and a lot of work. And that may be part of the pandemic that businesses don't actually survive. They're able to hold on until they can reopen, but, and then suddenly the costs of reopening are too much. But this is where, sorry, Steve, if I could interject. Please, yes. This is, you had a guest on a few nights ago from Sweden, the professor, the historian, mm -hmm. who had a great phrase, you cannot privatize the costs of a pandemic. In other words, they, he was explaining why they kept their schools open, because they didn't want the private household to absorb all of those costs. They kept the schools open. They had extra hygiene protocols. I think the same way we have to think of our public health system as encompassing the entire society and our business, especially our small ones, need the public health authorities to step in and provide those systems that would give them and the customers the sort of sense of safety that they can go in and shop and not feel like they're putting their life at risk, both the employees and the customers. This is a public problem and it requires public solutions to allow, this is the key thing, those private actors to come up with those creative solutions on the ground. The neighborhood businesses understand their local communities. You give them the tools and you ask the question at the start, Steve, about are they up to it? I think they are, they will find solutions, but you do need that sense of some public uh, investment here to allow both the, the, the sort of supply of the services we need and the demand to feel comfortable to exchange in, in that kind of marketplace. Can I just understand what you're saying there, Raphael? Do, do you yeah. mean that the state ought to be providing PPE, personal protective yeah. equipment, for every business establishment yeah. that feels it, it needs them to continue to be in business? In the short term, for sure, because you have the public health authorities who have the knowledge, the scientific knowledge upon which you can base what is a safe opening strategy. Of course, the knowledge doesn't reside in an entrepreneur. They don't, they're not going to know exactly how to, how to make sure that they're businesses are going to be um, ready for the reopening. And that's a public investment, just like a utility or a public street, maintaining those kind of public uh, uh, sort of infrastructure. This is more of a quasi social infrastructure will allow the businesses to, to do what they always do, which is find a market need and supply it to those that need it. And I think if we encourage that kind of local dimension to the reopening, we'll be in far better shape. This is what they did in Singapore and Taiwan. They managed to stay open even during the crisis because they, they, they knew that if you localize the transactions, the day-to-day -day life of, of, of a society, if there's an outbreak, you know where it happened and you know where it's contained. So I think the local dimension could, in, in the near term, be actually very good, good for our small businesses that have suffered so much. Hmm. Jan, let me try this with you. We, we know that even before COVID hit, there were lots of businesses that were in trouble. There were lots of retailers in particular that were in trouble. How much of the current predicament can you blame on COVID-19 and how much do you want to blame on just the fact that, you know, lots of businesses go under every year, regardless of what's happening? Boy, well, I'm a pro-business person, so I don't like to say that we've, uh, you know, we've got situations where we can't help businesses uh, grow and thrive. Yes, uh, throughout history, there's going to be times where certain, um, certain businesses, certain sectors, uh, may lo no longer be viable or relevant going forward. But I think, you know, as Ashley and, and Raphael have been saying, this is about Main Street. This is, this is who has totally been hit the worst. And Main Streets are just so critical to the livability of our cities, our towns. It's really important that we help uh, stand them up and get them back on their feet. Yes, there's always going to be certain businesses that may not make it. Um, but our mandate at the moment is just to make sure we help as many as possible get through this. But as I said, we're increasingly encouraged by the number of businesses, Main Street businesses uh, that are, are pivoting to how do they create a more viable digital presence to keep revenue coming in and provide services. Ashley, I'm not trying yeah. to be all doom and gloom here. I'm really not. <laughs> but, but I am imagining a scenario where if the consumer stampedes to more online services out of a sense of nervousness about going to a bricks and mortar establishment, I'm trying to imagine what the main streets of this province are going to look like mm. if, I, I mean, think about Main Street mm. right now. It's all small business. I mean, so much of it is small businesses. If they're not there, our cities and towns are going to look completely different. What, what does that look like to you? 
This is exactly our, our concern. Um, and, and, you know, we're already seeing businesses shut down. Um, we've been doing some, some polling as well and understanding that um, for many businesses, they have maybe another month left in them, uh, you know, six months from now, if, if we're still uh, under these same restrictions, uh, I think we could be looking at that kind of doomsday scenario. Um, it also raises the question of what happens after all of this, uh, when the landscape of independent business and small business has changed. What does that mean for entrepreneurism? What does that mean for people who want to start all over again or, or want to start um, their own business for the first time? Are we still going to have an environment in Canada, an economy in Canada that encourages that, that nourishes that? Uh, we're not sure yet, but it's a big concern. Raphael, could you follow up on that? What, what are our main streets mm -hmm. going to look like if nine out of yeah. 10 bricks and mortar businesses, retailers are no longer there? Yeah, no, and it's true. There were trends that were shaping what's going to happen post-crisis. In other words, that, that kind of kind of retail uh, clothing uh, style rest um, shop was in decline. The, the retail, the pure retail sector, uh, there were niches, toy stores, and sometimes uh, were doing okay. But but the general kind of retail space was was moving to an online model. But you know what? There's a lot of opportunity on a main street to provide personal services, which used to be hidden in the sort of back uh, sort of offices and, and sort of second and third floors of of buildings. Those mainline personal services. Think of your physiotherapists. Uh, optometrists should be on the main street now because that's what people are consuming. They're consuming services rather than goods. And I think if we move goods to an online model and bring services to the main street, we would actually be increasing accessibility for many parts of our population. Right now, you need to, you know, you need to sometimes go through several floors to get to those personal services, the medical services, and so on. And if they were brought down to the main street, this would actually be a an interesting revival of our main streets, so long as you still have those crucial kind of hospitality uh, and those niche retailers inhabiting a main street. So you have that complete neighborhood. So in theory, you could live in your neighborhood during a pandemic because all your needs would be supplied there, the local grocer uh, and, and all those kind of services. Um, so I think there's an opportunity post-crisis. And I think you were right when, I, when, when you mentioned, is this a public investment that has to be made to allow these businesses to sort of reopen? And I think it is. You can work in partnership with, with, with actors like the Board of Trade, like the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas, and the ones that represent the whole province. Those business improvement areas have already done the job of organizing the small business sector by neighborhood. So you can have a model which works with those institutions. And I think it would give the public a sense of, I think, security to re-emerge and re-enter that kind of public space. It's strange, Jan, that it, it may take a pandemic to completely reorient and redesign our cities in a way, frankly, that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time. Do you think business yes. is onto this? Oh, business for sure is on to that. We've got a very uh, successful uh, engineering firm called Transplan. Uh, they uh, typically look at transit management and congestion, and they've really pivoted to look at our sidewalks to say in an environment where we want to support social distancing, how do we think about how we use sidewalks and intersections? There's a whole re-education we're going to have to do to our pedestrians around how to best navigate. And it's things like one-way sidewalks, uh, looking at um, using uh, areas of a, a lane on the street just to allow for the movement of people uh, mm -hmm. much more easily in a physical distancing. So there's a number of examples of uh, individuals bringing solutions to the table in response to the pandemic. Uh, Transplan would be one of them. Another company I did want to uh, reflect on as well, it's a small business, it's a physiotherapist. As Raphael was saying, it's a, a Main Street business here in Toronto, and she's used Digital Main Street to mm. provide an online platform. She's now delivering physiotherapy piece services virtually throughout the province. So I think our ability to look at how do we solve for the problems that are impeding doing business the way we always did and get creative about things will be um, will be i think how we're going to merge through this with very strong main streets because we all still want our neighborhoods in place and intact okay jan i gotta understand that better how, how do you do i mean last i checked physiotherapy is a pretty hands-on business how do you do physio virtually yeah and she's able to do it by looking at assessments um, 
um, of the condition that the individual has, but also to coach through uh, exercises and mobility. It's not for all types of patients, but certain with sports injuries, those types of things where you need to be doing stretching and other things um, to deal with your treatment, she's now able to provide that. So it's been a really uh, wonderful transition for her to make that because it's keeping her business going at a time when she physically can't be seeing uh, patients or, or um, customers. Interesting. Well, in our last few minutes here, maybe we should not leave people with the sense that things are completely doom and gloom out there. Ashley, uh, again, if you've surveyed your members, any success stories out there or anything positive happening out there that you could point to? There are a lot, actually. We've been um, really surprised to see how resilient some businesses have been. But we've, uh, we've actually also been putting together a campaign, hashtag difference makers, where we feature uh, different businesses that have been um, either helping vulnerable communities or supporting healthcare workers in hospitals or retooling uh, so they, that they can uh, create PPE or, or medical supplies. And there are so many examples. Uh, I, I won't highlight one in particular, but I'll say that it's not just big businesses that are doing this, it's small mm -hmm. businesses too. Well, the, of course, the great yeah. example for big businesses is how auto parts manufacturers have completely retooled their lines mm -hmm. in order to create ventilators and the like. Um, but go ahead, let me push you a little bit. Give me one small business that you think has, has transformed um, either for PPE or anything else to, to respond to the needs of the time. Uh, well, I'll, um, I'll give you an example from uh, across the street from our office is a Chinese restaurant um, called Hongsheng who have um, completely uh, redesigned the entire idea of takeout and delivery. They're doing pop-ups across the city that are normally outside of their delivery zone. They're doing Lobster Fridays where, mm -hmm. where they give away a lobster. Um, they've got merchandise. Uh, they're starting to get into meal kits. They've really just thrown every creative idea at the problem and they seem to be doing quite well. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Raphael, let me give you the last minute. What do you sure. see out there that's hopeful? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, this all speaks these examples to what Jane Jacobs always recognized about a city. It's an ecology and it builds up from the bottom up. Um, we went on a, on a walking tour of the Danny, that's the Danforth Mosaic BIA. We were working with some students on a project Jan mentioned earlier of pairing up with BIAs and, and Digital Main Street across the city to help restart our kind of local Main Street economies. And as we walked by, the, the city businesses had already been doing clever things. There was a new shop that had opened up selling kind of spring water. Uh, it couldn't actually didn't even have its business license, but it was what it was doing was leaving these sort of um, boxes that they had shipped in from BC at the curbside for people to pick up. And strangely enough, they, they were worried about people stealing them. As long as it said it was for pickup, no one had sort of stolen any of their of their goods. And this was sort of a kind of phone operation. It wasn't even using their, their website. Uh, so people were phoning in to try to pick up their spring water and they were picking it up curbside. Um, the, the Danforth and the Bloor Street kind of corridor has the sort of highest concentration of business improvement areas a lot in the world. If you allowed those businesses a little bit of space, a little bit of room with the public health authorities to sort of say what is safe and what is not safe, you would see the innovation spring forward. I'm completely confident of that. Um, and the examples you've heard here today, I think, are turning to the positive, but you're right. We only have a few more weeks of this. If it goes on any longer, I think we can see something that could be truly devastating for our Main Street businesses. Oh, and, and you were making me so hopeful and optimistic oh, until I'm the sorry. very last thing well, you said. Manitoba has just right opened now. up. I think we're all going to be opening up soon. Good enough. Hey, I want to thank the three of you for joining us on TVO tonight. Rafael Gomez from the University of Toronto, Jan De Silva from the Toronto Region Board of Trade, Ashley Challoner, Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Be well, be safe, everybody, and talk to you again soon. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.